Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. While, while you're doing that, Ali, I'm going to jump back in and add, I neglected to mention that uh, your thesis won the university prize. So congratulations. And um, back to you. Thanks, Nick. Okay. Okay, so the title of the thesis upon which this presentation is based is Apprehending Transfer, a study of the Australian Sri Lankan response to unauthorized maritime arrivals. Um, I completed the writing at the start of the year and now having some distance from it, I'll do my best today to try and summarize it and answer any questions you may have of my argument. In the thesis, I attempted to describe and conceptualize Operation Sovereign Borders, specifically as it manifests in the relationship between Australia and Sri Lanka. This is the military led operation that many here in Australia will know about set up under Scott Morrison in 2013 after Tony Abbott stopped the boat election win. I set out, as Nick suggested, in, in about 2018 with an intention to better understand transfer, which broadly refers to attempts made by Sri Lankan and Australian security forces to stop and move people leaving Sri Lanka by boat. To research transfer, I conducted archival work and interviews. Um, I conducted this work starting in February 2020, as Nick said, when the pandemic began and was forced to conduct these interviews uh, either, online, either online or over the phone. And uh, again, as Nick said, I had to, we had had plans to do this work in courthouses, but I think like many over the past year and a half, had to kind of come up with alternative ways to think about the phenomenon I wanted to research in the current context. So what do I mean by transfer? In the Indian Ocean, Australian and Sri Lankan border security forces apprehend, patrol and move Sri Lankan men, women and children traveling by boat. Transfer ends on the Sri Lankan mainland where the public prosecutor charges transferees with criminal offenses for either leaving the country via an unapproved order of departure or organizing an illegal journey. The operation encompasses a range of practices, both on and offshore, and includes relationships between Australian security forces and security forces from other states deemed close to Australia. I focus on the arrangement between Australia and Sri Lanka for particular analytical reasons that I hope will become clear over the next 45 minutes. So, Transfer gained news media attention in 2014. In June of that year, Australian Minister for Immigration, Scott Morrison, arrived in Colombo for a ceremony commissioning two Bay-class Australian customs vessels signed over to Sri Lankan authorities. So here he is with uh, President Gotabi Rajapaksa and his brother Mahinda Rajapaksa in 2014. And during Morrison's visit, he issued a statement that said in the days preceding his arrival, Somewhere off the coast of Sri Lanka's eastern city of Batakaloa, Australian security forces transferred 41 people from an Australian Navy vessel into the hands of Sri Lankan authorities at sea. A 12 metre fishing vessel met the Australian Navy vessel, the ACV Trito, in Australia's contiguous zone, zone near Cocos Islands. Australian Navy personnel took its passengers on board. After a few days, the Trito moved back towards Sri Lanka with the Sri Lankan transferees on board. Just outside Sri Lankan territorial waters, it met the Sri Lankan vessel, the SLNS Samodura, and the people were moved from one vessel to the other. Once all the passengers were aboard, the Samodura made its way to the port in Gaul. I'm gonna to return to this example later on in the presentation and reflect upon some of the features of this moment that I think are particularly important for the conceptual argument I wanna make in the thesis, that I make in the thesis. But for now, I just wanted to give a general sense of what I mean by transport, transfer. In the thesis, I ask a seemingly straightforward question, which is what is the operation? An answer to a what question demands a descriptive and a conceptual answer. I ask this question with a view to provide a fuller account of transfer than is currently available in the literature. I describe how the Australian public learns about transfer and transferees largely from materials and media that aim to conceal the operation and keep it distant from public view. 
These materials include border force reports, documents released through Australia's freedom of, freedom of information mechanism, policy documents, documents produced for Australian Senate, from Australian Senate committee hearings, and country reports written by the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. A very different kind of practice exists in Sri Lanka, where the operation employs various organisations and professionals to publicly communicate the consequences of leaving Sri Lanka by boat. Materials produced by these organisations are more forthright about the events of transfer and the experience of transferees than those in Australia. Guided by the material, the contents these materials disclose, I interviewed 10 professionals, including 10, two defence lawyers, two public prosecutors, two development workers and two filmmakers in Sri Lanka, in addition to two healthcare professionals in Australia. I approached professionals because apart from the work of a small number of journalists in the early days of the operation, almost everything the public knows in Australia about transfer comes from sources produced by the Department of Home Affairs. The professional testimony I generated variously confirms or contradicts information provided in these sources. I also submitted 17 freedom of information requests to various Australian departments. It's from these materials that I argue for conceptualising the operation as an interdiction regime, an argument I hope will become clear by the end of the talk. Okay, so the plan that I have for today. I've just started by briefly sketching the problem and introducing the question I asked of transfer. Next, I'm gonna to turn to one of my key concepts, which is interdiction and explain its relevance to the study. I'll explain both a contextual and a conceptual justification for the use of this term. First, showing how interdiction has been used historically in practice in both the United States and Australia. And second, by showing why the, I think the term is useful for interpreting what the operation does when it transfers people. I'll then turn to consider the ways in which the publics in Australia and Sri Lanka come to know about transfer. If my aim is to describe transfer, I need to have some sense of how to work with materials that are created by state institutions to conceal its existence. In this section on concealment, I hope to show how I went about working with these concealed materials. Having done this, I'll then narrate transfer. And here I'm gonna draw out a couple of key moments in the transfer, pro transfer process. And we'll also consider the importance of a second concept, regime, to my conceptualization of the operation. To conclude, I'll return to the question of politics and provide a justification for inquiries that seek to unveil arrangements as I tried to do uh, in the thesis. My main conceptual claim is that the operation can be conceptualized as an Australian interdiction regime. And I'm gonna explain why interdiction is the concept I chose. To do so, I want to go back to a mo for a moment to Scott Morrison's visit in Sri Lanka in 2014. Specifically, I wanna focus on the Sri Lankan boat that returned the 41 people to Sri Lankan shores. I think this example really captures the contextual importance of this term, interdiction, because it shows that it's not simply representative of a particular legal logic, but also a significant flow of ideas and materials. So the SLNS Samodura was a gift from the United States Coast Guard. Before its inclusion in Sri Lanka's Navy fleet, it was known as US CGC Courageous. It's a medium endurance cutter that was recommissioned in the 1990s for the purposes of six week patrols throughout the Caribbean and Florida Strait. Since 1981, the US Coast Guard has intercepted and searched boats for migrants fleeing Haiti. On board its cutters, officers from the Immigration and Naturalization Service assess those migrants intercepted to determine whether they have credible fears of persecution. In US law and policy, these practices were referred to extensively as interdiction. Between 1981 and 1990, the Coast Guard recorded six passengers who fit the INS's credible fears criteria. The Coast Guard interdicted 23,000 Haitians during the same period. After the military coup in Haiti in 1991, the Coast Guard detained those assessed as fitting the credible fears criteria on board their boats themselves 
So at one point they held over 2,200 Haitians in custody on board their vessels at sea. In response to this, the Bush administration opened a facility in a then little known US territory on the southeastern coast of Cuba, Guantanamo Bay, where it would detain Haitians to preclude them access to the US justice system. Now, the connection to Australia comes in the form of a parliamentary bill digest that appears in 2001. This digest accompanied a piece of legislation titled Border Protection, Validation of and Enforcement of Powers Bill 2001, and sought to validate the actions of security forces in relation to the interdiction of the MV Tampa and other, other vessels during this period. The digest includes a specific section on, quote, the United States analogy which recounts the US program to transfer Haitian migrants and used the language of interdiction to describe US efforts to stop vessels and assess migrants on board cutters. This piece of legislation passed in one of many instances that Daniel Geiselbash has characterized as lesson drawing between the United States and Australia on interdiction efforts at sea. Conceptually, interdiction can be understood as a prohibition on movement. In Roman law, an interdict referred to a decree issued by a magistrate against a breach of civil law. It was issued at the request of a claimant to forbid something and was a decision more administrative than judicial in nature. Interdictum proceedings did not include hearings of witnesses or the examination of evidence. The magistrate decided on the sole basis of their authority whether or not a claim was deserving of protection. Decisions made on board US cutters and Australian Navy vessels share many features with such proceedings. Jeffrey S. Kahn shows how interdiction in the US case is constituted by administrative decisions, which rely on legal infrastructures that grant bureaucratic officials significant administrative discretion to decide upon the fate of Haitian migrants. He argues that through interdiction, U.S. officials engineer, quote, a space, space of decisionism without rendering the rule of law an open fiction. In the Indian Ocean, Australian security forces apprehend citizens from Sri Lanka, deny them access to adjudication, and hand them over to Sri Lankan state officers for prosecution. Just as interdictum proceedings are decided by a magistrate as an act of their imperium, and just as decisions to interdict are made aboard U.S. Coast Guard cutters, Interdiction is carried out by Australian state security forces with executive authority delegated to them by the Minister of Home Affairs, who has significant statutory powers under the Australian Migration Act to delegate these decisions. Practically, the process of decision-making uh, is, is an administrative interview consisting of four questions that is deployed uniquely to the Sri Lankan cohort of transferees. I'm going to describe this uh, interview in more detail when I narrate transfer. But uh, in response to this interview, transferees are neither able to challenge the decisions nor access an adjudicative body of any kind. And it's for these reasons that I think that these conceptual and contextual reasons that I find interdiction a compelling concept. Interdiction is made possible because the operation conceals its activities. And it is on this question of concealment that I focus on in chapter one of the thesis. I work closely with the ideas of Timothy Pachirat, who considers concealment in his ethnographic work in a slaughterhouse in Nebraska. Pachirat so shows how states or institutions benefit from expanding their field of visibility by collapsing distance and exposing concealed spaces. Such expansions involve making the citizen or worker more legible and are often associated with increased surveillance. On the other hand, societies also create distance and use concealment to hide processes that might otherwise not take, take place. Expanding the distance between citizens and acts of state violence or between workers and their work has the effect of refining what people deem physically or, mor or morally repugnant. Tactics of distance and concealment play a significant role in determining whether a society slaughters an animal in this way or that, or whether it moves people seeking asylum here or there. 
Pachirat ident identifies and describes these practices of concealment and distance in order to argue for what he calls a politics of sight, defined as organized concerted attempts to make visible what is hidden and to breach literally or figuratively, figuratively zones of confinement in order to bring about social and political transformation. Specific to a politics of sight is its politics. It's explicit in its aspirational aim to see what is hidden so as to transform it. Its practice is not simply about observing the world, but about choosing to situate or frame observations in such a way that foregrounds an imperative to change the violent practices of the institutions it observes. Pachirat's work also emphasizes that a politics of sight is not just about exposing a violent practice, i.e. what happens to animals slaughtered or what happens to people transferred. It is also concerned with exposing efforts to hide the practice, i.e. how slaughterhouses conceal killing, and in this instance, how the operation conceals transfer. The question for me became how to pursue a politics of sight under conditions that were not confined to a place like a slaughterhouse. The operation is not physically contained in the same way. Its vast physical domain extends between two islands on either side of the Indian Ocean. For this reason, the moment of transfer is closed off from the kind of ethnographic penetration that Pachirat recommends. But when the department conceals its activities, it still communicates in publicly visible ways. Researchers interested in the manner in which the operation obscures interdiction from the public can access Senate committee Hansard's FOI records, which can be read as indices of the department's approach to concealment. And while physical penetration may not be possible, the operation is not subject to the same partitions that exist in Pachirat's slaughterhouse. The voices of transferees under the operation exist as trails of redacted text on department interview transcripts, in videos produced for public communications campaigns in Sri Lanka, and in the testimonies of professionals who work with them. These two characteristics of the operation make a politics of sight possible. To show how concealment works under the operation, I'm going to walk us through a few documents that I use to produce my account of interdiction. For the sake of clarity, I'll divide these materials into those produced in Australia and those produced in Sri Lanka. I hope to demonstrate both how the operation conceals interdiction and how bringing disparate materials produced for different audiences together can illuminate it. So first to Australia, three kinds of documents conceal interdiction in Australia. First, Australian legislation has been written to preclude access to the Migration Act for people arriving by boat. Definitions of the unauthorised maritime arrival have radical impl implications for what it is in law that an Australian vessel meets when it contacts a boat inside or beyond Australian waters. From anywhere, a maritime officer may detain a person and take them to a place inside or outside the migration zone. The writing of law allows for the physical distancing of boats that security forces encounter at sea. Second, in Senate committee events, like that of the Tampa crisis in 2001, we get a demonstration of how the department is not only deliberate in its attempts to conceal images of refugees, but explicit in its desire to characterize them in a particular way. Photographers on board Navy vessels, for example, for example, were specifically instructed not to take, quote, personalizing or humanizing images of people they encountered at sea. Finally, the department continues to hide documents and testimony in Australia requested through FOI related to what it describes as on water matters, a catch all phrase describing, quote, any operational activity relating to the maritime domain that has been widely deployed when ministers or members of the department face public inquiry. The department's various justifications for concealing documents, which at base amount to justifications for hiding just about anything, reinforce how concealment is strategic. I wanna emphasize that these documents don't simply provide evidence of active attempts by government departments to conceal and manipulate information. They also reveal things about transfer itself which suggests that productive work can be, can be done using archives of the state. 
In Sri Lanka, the operation has very different objectives. Here it pursues a strategic communications campaign it calls Zero Chance that aims to deter migrants from leaving Sri Lanka by boat. The operation employs local and international advertising agencies to produce interviews in Sinhala and Tamil, which are run on social media and TV. Of these, one series titled Unfortunate True Stories provides detailed descriptions of transferees' encounters with Australian and Sri Lankan security authorities. In contrast to the dehumanised image of the refugee the department once seen in Australia, at the Sri Lankan end of the operation, transferees appear on screen answering questions designed to provoke a, provoke a compassionate response from their audience for, for pedagogic purposes. Sri Lankans are invited to imagine themselves on a boat at sea, crippled by debt or rejected by loved ones at home. A very kind, different kind of transferee than the one we encounter here in Australia. These same agencies run film competitions, which ask applicants to explore the idea that it is illegal to attempt to go to Australia by boat. The operation also engages small NGOs by funding through IOM on Sri Lanka's eastern coast to do similar work in person through the running of workshops. These organisations are known to hire transferees that the operation has returned as part of their workshop activities. The point here is that the operation conceals transfer significantly in Australia, whereas in Sri Lanka, some events of transfer are presented quite plainly. Bringing these materials together is helpful if one is interested in describing interdiction. Now, having done all of this setup work, I'm going to now uh, pause and start to narrate transfer. Um, and the narration I provide of transfer is a composite description. It's a story written from testimonies of various kinds, some of which I have talked about or talked to already. My archival work also consisted of reading newspaper reports, a small amount of secondary literature dating back to the early days of the operation, and a number of policy documents released through FOI. I complemented these materials with interviews I conducted in 2020, the description I'm going to provide today is heavily condensed, but I've tried to just draw out some of the more important parts of the process for the purposes of my conceptual argument. And once I've finished describing interdiction, I'm going to turn to this argument again, particularly focusing on the concept of regime. On board Navy vessels, Transferees report different experiences. State officials and two lawyers I spoke to said that Australian officials provide transferees with food, water and blankets. Others say that officials separate men and women, including splitting up families. Transferees report being held below deck. Some have reported being locked up and that Australian officials provided them with very little food or water. An official from the Department of Home Affairs then administers the screening process which consists of asking transferees four questions. These have been conducted by some kind of walkie-talkie or satellite phone. Some said that they never got any advice from officials on board and that instead the captain of the vessel merely told them to say something into the satellite phone. An interviewee suggested people from the department were brought on board to conduct these interviews. The process from the moment the boat is intercepted until a decision is made may take several days during which transferees are detained on board Navy vessels or at one of Australia's excised territories. Afterwards, they are moved and handed over to Sri Lankan authorities. If the Navy moves them by air, they do so via an excised territory. If by sea, Australian security forces embark transferees on small boats from which Sri Lankan authorities take them aboard. Transferees report being held by Sri Lankan Navy personnel on the lower decks of their ships and being subject to another round of questioning. The Sri Lankan Navy then chooses the port of arrival where transferees are disembarked. In Colombo, immigration officers determine whether transferees are present in local databases which house the names and details of suspected ter terrorists or registered criminals. Sometimes transferees pass through immigration and are questioned by plain-clothed officers from the state intelligence service. In two cases documented by Charmin the Jayasinghe, transferees were identified as rehabilitated LPPE cadres 
handcuffed by these officers and taken to a terrorism investigation, investigation department cell in Colombo. Transferees are then handed over to the Maritime Human Smuggling Investigation Unit of the Criminal Investigation Department, or CID. CID is responsible for investigating suspected contraventions of Section 45 of Sri Lanka's, Sri Lanka's Immigration Act. The Maritime Investigation Unit was established in 2010 with financial and technical assistance from the Australian Federal Police. Police take transferees to an office located inside the airport, which was built with funding from the Australian government. Police interview transferees one at a time to determine which of the two offences that the transferee will be accused of, either leaving the country via an, other, via an unofficial port of approval, uh, via an unofficial port, or for organising an illegal journey, the latter of which is a more serious offence. The Australian government admits that after these interviews, the CID may conduct, quote, further inquiries about activities while aboard if returnees are suspected to be former LTTE, LTTE members. Now, further inquiries captures a wide range of activities. <clears throat> Char Charminder Jayasinghe records a number of instances in which transferees reported being subjected to torture at the hands of Sri Lankan authorities during 2014. Lassith, a defence attorney, told me that transferees had, through affidavit, said that during a similar interview at CID headquarters, quote, they had seen Australian authorities inside interrogation chambers. These clients were familiar with the uniform of the AFP, he said, because they were taken by Australian authorities to Christmas Island. Charges are brought to either the closest magistrate's court or to courts in Colombo. People are usually produced to these courts within 24 hours. This is a fundamental right guaranteed by the Sri Lankan constitution, but magistrates courts don't sit every day. So at times this waiting period may be longer. During this time, police hold transferees in remand. Remand may be at the CID's airport office or in a holding cell at the airport. If security forces have moved transferees to one of Sri Lanka's ports, Police will remand them in detention centres close to the port of arrival. Police have remanded transferees in the Busa Detention Centre, known as the site the CID and Terrorism Investigation Department used to interrogate and torture people detained under Sri Lanka's Prevention of Terrorism Act. The offence that transferees are charged with has significant implications for bail applications and the plea of those the CID charges. For the offence of organising, bail cannot be granted by a magistrate. This means that if an individual is charged with organising, they are moved straight to remand. Such people remain in remand for as long as 12 months while the Attorney General Department decides whether to press charges. For leaving an unofficial port, Magistrates exercise a degree of discretion when deciding whether a transferee should be granted bail. Varsha, a defence attorney, attorney who has worked defending transferees since the early 2000s, said to me that the prospects for bail differed significantly depending on the magistrate. Quote, the outcomes different, differ from magistrate to magistrate. Some magistrates just want to punish people because they tried to tarnish the country's name. The whole process seems redundant. Baisha said to me, after reflecting on the duration of the cases, the lack of interest from the prosecution, the small handful of sentences and the difficulty of generating solid evidence. Haseen, who works for the Attorney General's department, told me that these cases end up taking years because they're so down, far down the list of priorities for the Attorney General. Neither the prosecutors, the CID, the transferees, nor the defence lawyers are interested in these cases and everyone involved wants the cases finished as soon as possible. Even the court is happy with this, Varsha said to me. No one in the process wants these cases to go on and on. And yet they do. In 2019, there were over 800 cases pending in a court, most involving several people. The fact does not provide figures for the number of cases that have concluded. The question I asked at the beginning of the presentation was, what is the operation? And I suggested earlier that an, ask, an answer to a what question demands 
descriptive and conceptual component. I argued the operation can be conceptually understood as an interdiction regime. As I have already suggested, the concept interdiction uh, emphasizes how the handing over of bodies from Australian to Sri Lankan security forces depends on the substantial discretionary powers vested in the executive in Australia, which administers immigration procedures and then confers this power to its authorities. The operation does not operate in a completely lawless void, but rather a space in which these assessments officials conduct resemble rubber stamps from the executive. But, the tra but transfer is also the consequence of significant cooperation between Sri Lankan and Australian authorities. And it's for this reason that I draw on Lauren Benton's work on legal regimes. Lauren Benton defines a global legal regime as a pattern of structuring multiple legal authorities, which extend, extends beyond the borders of particular legal systems and establishes repeatable routines for incorporating groups with separate legal identities in, the production, in production and trade and for accommodating or changing culturally diverse ways of viewing the regulation and exchange of property. In the, in the narration above, I recalled instances of this cooperation. Sri Lankan officials sharing intelligence about domestic policing operations, the Australian government providing funding for investigation units specifically targeting transferees, and Australian and Sri Lankan security forces consistently contacting each other during patrolling or when actually apprehending and moving transferees. In addition, prosecutors, defence attorneys and transferees approach the cases I described with little interest which begs the question, why pursue them at all? One part of the answer may be that Australian officials place immense pressure on the Attorney General's Department and the CID to stop both leaving Sri Lanka. Jaya Singh, her rights of liaison officers at the Australian High Commission, communicating regularly with law enforcement officers in Sri Lanka to exert pressure, such that they, quote, aggressively pursue the people smugglers. The Australian government has also facilitated the training of state prosecutors at the Sri Lankan Attorney General's Department through the Sri Lankan Australian Joint Working Group on People Smuggling. A lawyer told me these arrangements are very different to those Sri Lanka has with other countries. People that are returned to Sri Lanka from Canada and the United Kingdom are not interviewed by the CID, but the Terrorism Investigation Department. Others returning from India in the same way are not questioned at all, and the CID is not notified of their arrival. No regime exists in either case to manage bodies in the way the operation does. But while the operation is a regime, I argue it's not a legal regime. Apprehension under the operation does not exist on what David Dyzenhouse called a legality continuum. For a regime to be located there, individuals who have hypothetically asked the question, but how can that be law for me? can receive a reasoned answer from, the, from an official independent of the person who acted. The reasons officials supply for enacting a given law should justify their use of authority. Adjudicators in legal regimes can still treat certain groups of people differently if their justifications for doing so are predicated upon the fundamental principles of a given legal order. Under such circumstances, some subjects may get answers from adjudicators that they don't like. Legal orders on the continuum can still undermine the first class status, status of subjects. And it's for this reason that Dyson House names it a continuum. At one end of the, end of the continuum are uh, rule of law regimes, and at the other are found regimes more perverse. But for Dyson House, the condition of legality requires that, it, that individuals are able to ask this question and receive a reasoned answer. If they cannot, the regime slips off the continuum. The operation of does not appear on the continuum of legality because transferees do not have access to an adjudicator independent of the official acting and are not provided with a reason for a decision made about their status. The answers transferees provide to officials are subject to the interpretation of these same officials who are empowered by the minister to decide on them. As a result, what Sri Lankan boats encounter in the Indian Ocean is something more akin to an amalgamated policing intervention administered together by security forces from two separate states. To be clear, my argument for understanding the operation as one single interdiction regime is not one about what Sri Lankan and Australian states are empirically, 
In other words, it's not an argument that these states don't exist separately. It's rather an interpretive claim regarding a particular set of circumstances these two states produce together at sea, that if apprehended simply as such, would fail to capture features of the arrangement. The importance of viewing the operation as an interdiction regime, I summarise in the thesis as follows. Viewed as an interdiction regime, the handing over of the transferee from Australian to Sri Lankan authorities no longer looks like the movement of the body from one state in its jurisdiction to another. Instead, it is just the movement of the body from inside one part of the regime to another part. This movement is just like the movement of the animal to be slaughtered in Pachirat's slaughterhouse. The animal is moved in bits and pieces from one concealed space to another so as to mystify the process of slaughter and guarantee its completion. Just like the slaughterhouse moves the animal, the operation moves the body of the transferee to be transferred from one concealed part of the regime in Australia to another part in Sri Lanka. It does this to mystify the process of interdiction and to guarantee the prohibition's success. To conclude, I want to return to Pachirat's definition of a politics of sight. A politics of sight relies for its efficacy on an assumption that descriptions of acts of state violence can in fact provoke political transformation. Making the hidden visible is an imperfect art. Acts of uncovering can generate new and new methods and tactics of concealment and efforts to expose arrangements like the operation are precarious because the resources that states are willing to throw at maintaining the veil are immense. The procedures for concealment I describe illustrate how at many corners in the history of the operation, new and innovative ways to conceal interdiction emerge in response to unwanted exposures. However, if the pursuit of a politics of sight is sensitive to context and concealment, Pachirat argues, it can transform the way the public sees acts of state violence and perhaps even alter the political conditions which allow for them to take place. Ultimately, this inquiry suggests that a politics of sites practice requires patience and persistence. I wrote this following sentence in my thesis and nine months later, it remains true. Sitting in my inbox are a collection of FOI requests to which I have not yet received replies. In all requests except one, the department contravened its statutory obligation to respond to requests within 60 days. Some have now sat there for over a year. These requests are indicative of a trend in Australia. Government departments are denying requests and contravening their obligation to respond more than ever before. This is an effective strategy for discouraging pursuits of sight, especially when people who most often submit FOI requests, journalists and academics, are working to tight deadlines. Discouragement of this kind is a constitutive feature of the department's approach to concealment. And so for a politics of sight to be effective, one must be open to the possibility that attempts to reveal state violence are often unsuccessful and that state violence can exist in plain sight. It also requires researchers to sit with the things that they find and contemplate the implications of exposing them because exposure alone is insufficient if the goal is to transform the political conditions that make state violence possible. Uh, that's that's all from, from me and I'm happy to take any questions and do my best to answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver. If you can just close the slides, first of all, that will get everyone back on the screen. Great, thank you.